Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Mr. Donnelly, no. What could be the largest multinational trade deal in history sharply divides Congress and Hoosiers. The standard of living in these countries is increasing. Me as a, you know, Indiana farmer thinks that we can, uh, you know, provide a lot of what they're looking for. But union workers say loosening restrictions on developing countries could threaten their livelihoods. What's at stake in the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Thousands of people have lost their voice to a disease we don't know much about. The people hear my voice, they think I've got a cold or uh, that I'm sick. What research is being done to find the cause and cure for the disease? And what stands in the way? Plus, students create electricity by walking through the halls. We'll tell you how. These stories and a look at this week's top headlines right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Barbara Harrington, in for Joe Wren. A massive trade deal, deal that would impact Indiana's economy is in limbo. President Obama and Congress are battling over the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which has been in the works for nearly a decade. The deal would create a partnership between economic juggernauts like the United States and Japan, as well as emerging countries like Malaysia and Vietnam, whose economies are just developing and in turn, demand for foreign goods is expected to grow. But some politicians and some Hoosiers are questioning the deal's implications. This field that we have behind me is a uh, field of corn that was planted uh, just one week ago. David Harden's family has been planting corn in these Danville fields since 1968. This is actually corn that is raised for human consumption. It's uh, not going to be going into any kind of uh, animal feed. In addition to corn, he grows soybeans and winter wheat and raises hogs. And a good portion of his product is sent overseas. The pigs that we raise on the farm, again, some of them are, are for domestic consumption, but the packing plant that we sell to also sells a lot of pork to Japan. That's why this small town farmer is keeping a close eye on what's happening in the big city of Washington, D.C. Mr. Peters, no. Earlier this week, the Senate voted against giving President Obama fast track authority that would make it easier to finalize negotiations on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The deal would establish trade rules for the 12 countries involved, which encompass about 40% of the world's gross domestic product. It will be very beneficial, producing a level playing field for everyone, helping to protect intellectual property rights, also protecting investors. And all those elements are very crucial for the United States looking for, uh, in, in the future. Obama wanted Congress to give him the authority to negotiate the specifics of the partnership up until the end, then take an up or down vote without offering any amendments, something the president says has to happen in order for the deal to move forward. There are, for this specific case, there are 12 countries involved. And there are a lot of vested interest in every country. And so if you open up this negotiation process and made it accessible, there are so many opposing forces that they would try to boycott any further negotiation. And that's the reason why there is some secrecy in that. But several members of the president's own party raised concerns about the partnership and voted against fast-tracking the process. Senator Joe Donnelly was one of them. 
In a statement, he said, when Hoosier workers lose nearly every time our country signs a new trade agreement, as a U.S. senator, you don't give up your ability to offer amendments to help our state's businesses and workers. You don't give up your seat at the table. You fight for a better deal. That's welcome news to some unions, including United Food and Commercial Workers Local 75, which represents workers in several Midwest states, including in Indiana. They say the partnership doesn't provide environmental or employment protections and therefore could cost the U.S. jobs. I think all throughout the Midwest, we've seen what's happened to our economy when good manufacturing jobs go away. I mean, it can really pull the floor out from underneath entire communities, and that's something that we don't want to see more of. But Indiana Farm Bureau policy advisor Kyle Klein says the partnership would benefit Hoosier farmers by making it cheaper for them to sell their products overseas. We're able to be in those markets with relatively high tariffs, so TPP gives us an opportunity to reduce those tariffs, and uh, which uh, will result in additional sales for our farm products here in Indiana, and uh, we'll, we'll feel the uh, economic benefits here close to home. Back on his farm in Danville, Hardin is hopeful legislators will come to an agreement sometime this summer, because when he looks out at his fields, he sees opportunity. You know, about one in five pigs grown in the United States ends up being exported. So we see that that could only grow if uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership comes to fruition. Indiana's other senator, Republican Dan Coats, supports the trade deal and voted in favor of fast-tracking it this week. In a statement, Coates said, in Indiana, more trade means more jobs. Increasing international trade will bolster our economy, create new opportunities for American businesses, and enhance our national security. And while China is not part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, economists say this is a strategic move in that direction on the U.S.'s part. Governor Mike Pence was in China this week on a trade mission hoping to bolster relations with the country. He says China is working toward addressing some of its economic abuses. He spoke to leaders there about the possibility of a treaty with the U.S. that would demonstrate China's commitment to addressing those issues. The governor expects China to embrace more free market principles in the future, which could create more trade opportunities for Indiana. The trip is Pence's sixth overseas trade mission as governor and his second to Asia. China is Indiana's fifth largest trading partner with $1.4 billion in exports. Now for headlines, we go over to Lindsay Wright, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thank you, Barbara. Former Indiana Democratic Congressman Baron Hill is throwing his hat in the ring for U.S. Senate. The Columbus Republic is reporting Hill made the announcement at a Democratic Party dinner last night. Hill hopes to take over Senator Dan Coates' seat after Coates announced earlier this year he is not seeking another term. Hill represented Indiana's 9th Congressional District from 1999 to 2005, and then again from 2007 to 2011, when he was defeated by Republican Todd Young. Con Congressman Marlon Stutzman and former Coates Chief of Staff Eric Holcomb are seeking the Republican nomination. Well, State Senator Karen Tallien from Portage officially announced her candidacy for governor this week. Tallien is a 10-year veteran of the state Senate and says she's been considering a run for governor for two years. Tallien will square off in the Democratic primary against former House Speaker John Gregg, who previously ran in 2012. Tallien says she won't say anything negative about Gregg, but notes that as a single mother from a major urban area, she and Gregg are very different people. I think that I have a different perspective on urban poverty issues, on urban diversity issues. Uh, I also think I have a different perspective on women's issues. Um, sh surely my views on, on choice and on women's health care and access to health care have got to be different from John's. Italian rejected the notion that such a progressive candidate can't win in such a conservative state, saying Indiana isn't as red as the legislature makes it seem. Two more positive HIV cases were reported in southern Indiana earlier this week, bringing the total to 155 people who have tested positive for the virus. Almost all cases have been linked to injection drug use. A needle exchange program set up in April allows drug users to trade in dirty needles for clean ones in hopes of stopping further spread of the virus. 
LifeSpring Health Systems has offered addiction counseling services through a local community center and 11 are currently being treated at a 30-day rehab program. LifeSpring CEO Terry Staywar says he's impressed by people's motivation in the facility, but many of their problems lie ahead. Housing is another big issue we keep hearing from the people, that they're going right back into the same houses where the addiction is occurring, sometimes multi-generational, and they're looking for alternatives. Uh, a lot of folks are not living in their own house, they're living with someone else that we're seeing at least. And so getting that housing issue uh, taken care of is going to be a big part, I think, of the long-term solution. Staywar says LifeSpring is seeing about 12 patients a week from the Austin area, four times the amount before the HIV outbreak. Lawmakers are calling for a summer study committee into problems at the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. An independent audit released this week shows Hoosiers have been overcharged on more than a dozen fees, amounting to nearly $60 million. The report also found the BMV undercharged customers on 10 separate fees. While the BMV commissioner has said he is working to correct the problems, Indianapolis Democratic Representative Dan Forrestal says the BMV cannot be trusted to act on its own, so lawmakers need to study the issue this summer and vote next year on new laws reforming the department. Concussions are more likely to occur in football practices than in games, according to two Indiana researchers. A report published in the journal Pediatrics included research from the NCAA Sports Science Institute and the Data List Center for Sports Injury and Prevention Research, both based in Indianapolis. It found that in high school and college football, 58% of concussions happen during practices. The head of the Indiana High School Athletic Association says the results aren't surprising, but he hopes they give more legitimacy to what his organization is already doing. The IHSAA is in the middle of surveying its football coaches and could create guidelines next year, limiting the amount of contact practices players participate in each week. Indiana beekeepers lost about half of the bees in their colonies this past year. That's according to new data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Bee Informed Partnership. In 2013, Indiana bee colonies were hit particularly hard. The state's population decreased by 65 percent, making Indiana's losses some of the worst in the country. This past year wasn't as bad, with beekeepers losing about 51 percent of their bees. That's slightly higher than the national average. A strain of avian influenza that has never before been seen in Indiana has appeared in a backyard hobby flock in Whitley County, just west of Fort Wayne. The strain called H5N8 is similar to the influenza strain that has killed millions of chickens, turkeys, and other birds across the Midwest in recent months. State officials say they don't know if the disease has spread elsewhere and the source of the virus has not yet been identified. The virus does not pose a food sa safety threat. The city of Kokomo is reporting a dramatic increase in heroin overdoses. City officials say there are almost as many overdoses in the first few months of this year as in all of 2014. Howard County police say the drug has become common in the area because it's inexpensive, highly addictive, and easy to obtain. Eleven people have died so far this year. Pending toxicology tests could raise that number to as high as 17. Indiana State University is starting work on an effort that will result in the nation's first comprehensive regulations for commercial drone use. ISU is one of the 16 higher education institutions partnering with the Federal Aviation Administration to create a national center of excellence for unmanned aircraft systems. Reporter Casey Kuhn traveled to ISU to see what that university brings to the table. For now, the Federal Aviation Administration doesn't allow commercial drone use without a special permit. But as a new program begins at Indiana State University, the drone business could soon see some major changes. Indiana State University is actually one of 16 universities working with the FAA to help develop new rules for unmanned aerial vehicles, just like this one. ISU's program focuses on training operators to use drones for jobs they call the three Ds, dull, dirty, or dangerous. For example, a drone could help inspect a cell phone tower or bring aid to disaster sites. Director of the Center for Unmanned Systems Research Donald Bonte says ISU is in a unique position because it's had a drone program for four years already and has a partnership with the Terre Haute International Airport. I think we're behind in, in this country and, and that's just uh, 
because the FAA uh, wanted to do a very fine job, wanted to make sure they get it right and, and taking uh, the time to, to get their rules published. But the business world isn't going to wait, so they're going to test where they can test. Bonte says drones are a rapidly growing industry, which means these new rules could bring more business to Indiana. The FAA hasn't yet said when it will issue final regulations on commercial drone use. Sophomore Devin Davis and senior, senior Hunter Mascara Perea have been dismissed from the Indiana University men's basketball program effective immediately. In a statement, IU Athletics said the players were, quote, not living up to their responsibilities to the program. Davis was cited earlier this week for possessing marijuana in his dorm room. Mascara Perea was with Davis but was not charged with any crime. The University of Notre Dame is teaming up with the Benedictine community at the historic Kyle Moore Abbey in Ireland to create a center with a shared spiritual, cultural, and educational mission. The Benedictine nuns purchased the Kyle Moore Castle in 1920 and converted it into an abbey. They use it, used to run a boarding school at the abbey, but they had to close it down in 2006 because of a drop in demand. So now Barbara students might once again get to walk the halls of the abbey because of the Notre Dame partnership. It's expected to begin next year. A little studying, a little sightseeing, that doesn't sound like a bad deal to me. Thanks, Lindsay. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Thousands of Americans live with voice disorders every day, but so far, there's no cure. Ahead, what Indiana doctors and researchers are doing to try to change that. And can creating renewable energy be as easy as walking? We take you to one school that's experimenting with electricity producing floor tiles. These stories next on Indiana News Desk. Nature takes you places where you've never gone before. It's watching something that's actually happened. Nature sure draw me in the story. Just their power and their grace. You know, it was just so beautiful to watch them. The, the movement and just watching the body and watching the chase. Like this huge, lush, vibrant watercolor. Tim's. <laughs> There was such a shot of underneath watching these elephants swim in this deep water. I had no idea even they could swim like that. I saw the one monkey pulling on this one monkey's tail, and the monkey like, man, what you doing? What you doing? It's like the theater of the wild or something. Seven billion trillion animals living on one planet. It's like more colorful than life, than you think life can possibly be. Somewhere between the mystique and the beauty of it is reason enough to, to sit down and watch. That's life. And that's nature. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. I'm Barbara Harrington, in for Joe Wren. Spasmodic dysphonia is a rare disease that affects the vocal cords. It strikes seemingly at random, causing people to lose their voice, but often only when they try to speak normally. Some people can still sing, whisper, or even speak in accents. It's these anomalies that puzzle researchers who can't seem to figure out what's causing the disorder or why it only affects certain parts of speech. Gretchen Frazee reports on the latest spasmodic dysphonia research and what the chances are of a breakthrough. Okay, Ten years ago, Bev Matthews began to notice her voice faltering. Could you calculate the difference? When she talked on the phone or met with her coworkers, it was hard to speak. I thought that something had triggered uh, my self-confidence to, to drop. And I, I kept trying to find ways to improve that by reading self-help books, anything I could get my hands on to try to figure out what's going on here, what's causing uh, my voice to, to give out on me. She saw one doctor after another after another. It would be months before someone finally referred her to the Voice Clinic of Indiana. Doctors administered more tests and finally a diagnosis. Matthews had spasmodic dysphonia. Well, I had never heard of it. I went on the internet to try to research everything. The diagnosis seemed spot on. A voice that sounds strained, whispery or breathy. Spasms that sometimes silenced her voice altogether. It was a relief on one hand to finally begin to understand the problem. But Matthew says living with a disorder few people know about isn't easy. Typically when people hear my voice, they think I've got a cold or uh, that I'm sick, which I, I 
I want to dispel because I don't want them to think I'm sick, but sometimes it's easier just to say, yeah, I've got a cold, than to explain spasmodic dysphonia. This is an examination of a normal patient, and as we move forward with the scope, you'll see the vocal cords, which are in the center here, and they have to come together fully, and their job is to turn air that's rushing past the vocal cords into sound that ultimately comes out as our speech. In spasmodic dysphonia, we lose the control of that a bit because of the effect that the disease has on the, on the muscles of the voice box. And so as the patient's about to use their voice, what we'll see is instead of seeing the nice vocal cord um, uh, coming together and the normal vibration, we're gonna see spasms of the vocal cords. <laughs> To calm down those spasms, patients regularly get Botox treatments. Doctors inject the drug, which is more commonly used by plastic surgeons to help erase wrinkles, into the patient's neck muscles. It's considered one of the best treatments for spasmodic dysphonia, but it only reduces the symptoms. It's not a cure. Neurologist Jay Bott says prevention is tough when doctors still don't know the cause. We do know that there's a short circuit in the brain, and it's in the area called the basal ganglia. Now, some of them are genetic, so some people are, are born with these conditions that then develop over time, uh, and actually we know some genes that actually cause this type of dystonia. Unfortunately, the vast majority of dystonias that we see uh, just happen. We call them idiopathic, and we don't know why they happen. The affected part of the brain is very small, and there are only a couple of laboratories in the U.S. that have the equipment to see the microscopic areas. In Rita Patel's lab at Indiana University, she's developing a system that records the movements of vocal cords at a rate more than 130 times faster than typical video. She can then play back the recording much more slowly and actually see the muscle spasms in spasmodic dysphonia patients. In some of our studies, we found that uh, within one type of spasmodic dysphonia, there are uh, several subtypes. So if we can um, better classify the problem, then I think we can deliver uh, even more specific treatments. They might be able to identify the specific muscles that would benefit from Botox, for example. But spasmodic dysphonia only affects 0.02 percent of the population, or between 50 and 100,000 people in the U.S. So there aren't many people to participate in the studies. For this initial study, we are recruiting 10 individuals with spasmodic dysphonia. Um, so far, we have recruited six. And because the disease is so rare, funding for research also becomes an issue. It unfortunately doesn't meet, you know, it doesn't jump to the radar of the congressional leaders who help allocate money for different conditions and you know, what research, what is researched. Still, researchers are hopeful studies will soon reveal new, more effective treatments for spasmodic dysphonia and maybe one day a cure. In the meantime, Matthew says there's something else she would like to see. Having an understanding a more global understanding in the population of this disorder helps those who are suffering with it. So that people understand when we stutter when we're hoarse, what's causing us to have these problems and to be empathetic mm -hmm. to people who have voice issues. Spasmodic dysphonia affects women about twice as often as men. People who use their voice regularly, such as teachers, are also at greater risk, although researchers don't know why, and they say the disease is still very rare. A group of high school students at Bloomington High School South unveiled a project this week that took a science project literally one step further. The school recently installed a set of floor tiles that create electricity every time someone steps on them. Claire McInerney visited the school to see how it works. London-based technology company PaveGen creates the tiles, and after Bloomington South students learned about the company in an AP science class last year, they wanted to get the tiles installed in their school. They wrote a few grant proposals and received money from Duke Energy and the Raymond Foundation, and they installed the display. Freshman Brittany Underwood and Isabel Fernandez demonstrate how the tiles work. Press it down and it starts making kinetic energy and then that energy charges a battery and that battery stores the energy and then that battery can be used to charge a cell phone or light up one of these boards or just anything else. The eight tiles at Bloomington South are the first installation of paved gen tiles at a public institution in the U.S., and right now they're being used for educational purposes. 
The high school students are bringing in elementary school kids and using the tiles to teach them about renewable energy as well as basic science and math skills. We want them to kind of learn that one, there are different ways to have renewable energy other than just solar panels because that's what everybody thinks. And then we also want them to learn that they can do it themselves and they have access to these kinds of energy. While younger kids are learning about the science and math used to make the tiles work, the high school students are gaining leadership experience and getting a glimpse into the business world. And this is something that gives people in this age group hope that you can be creative, you can own a startup, you can have a brilliant idea, it can be spread all over the world, um, and that they can be powerful, no pun intended. <laughs> The tiles are installed all over the world, including locations like Heathrow Airport in London and under the turf of a soccer field in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The tiles at Bloomington South are one of few installations in the United States. Well, that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUNews.org. Have a great weekend, folks. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank member FDIC and equal housing lender, and by WTIU members. Thank you.